Welcome to the Andy Noise Experience, a podcast, endurance, noise, random musings. It's about four o'clock. It's uh, Wednesday, September 8th, 2020. I always can't remember the date, even though I can look at the computer, but man, it's just, you know, especially with COVID, time just seems to just be so weird. And then yeah, and you get older. I mean, I'm 57 years old, and man, it seems like last week was so long ago, but today, so long. You know, I went out this morning and put in my miles. It was really, really smoky. It was super weird last night. I uh, didn't have run camp. People didn't show up, so I stayed home. Did a swift workout on the on my treadmill. And then I went out in my backyard like at 7 o'clock at night. And while I was in my room on my treadmill, I was like, why is it so dark outside? And it was because of all the smoke. We've just got amazingly big fires out here in California. What else could possibly go wrong? So I went out and swam. Had a good swim workout. And then I got home, got back in the house and I'm working on, you know, the podcast and the YouTube channel. And I'll tell you, it's just kind of a lot of work. It's overwhelming trying to figure out what to do, what not to do. And, you know, I kind of with my podcast, just do what I do. And so <clears throat> I um, I always want to scratch my head, too. Uh, yeah, I got on to, you know, doing thumbnails because I guess with thumbnails, people actually will find your stuff and maybe click on it and listen to it. And uh, so I've been working on that. And so I saw this thing, and I should know better because, you know, whenever you see something like this, you shouldn't do it. It's a thumb blaster. I went and, you know, clicked on that, looked at it. And they're like, oh, you get all these templates for a pretty decent price. And it ended up for like 20 bucks, I could get like 60, 70 templates to make better thumbnails and bring about a better product. And, you know, and just, uh, you know, want, want what I'm saying to get out to the world and, you know, just doing it the old school way where I'm just doing a video, throwing it up without any thumbnails, without any search optimizing and all that. You know, you're just going to get lost in the clutter. There's just so much out there. So I get this product and it's decent. I'm working with it. And then they're like saying, you know, and then I see all these other thumbnails. And they're like, oh, well, those are the pro ones. So on most websites, you know, you click on it and you can check out the other features. And I clicked on it, looked at it, you know, thought, nah, not for me. Next thing I know, I get a text or a, you know email from PayPal that I just got charged fifty bucks just by looking at the site. I got put on the Thumb Blaster. They charged me for the upgrade to Pro account. I never clicked anywhere. I didn't click in a you know, there wasn't a basket. Basically, just clicking on the page sold it to me. So they got access to my PayPal information. I'm, I'm fighting them. You know, I wrote talked to their they 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 go through a system that's called ClickBank. ClickBank charged my PayPal. What a terrible name for a bank. You know, clickbait, clickbank. So it's just super, ah, oh, it's just so annoying. So I'm fighting with them. I'm going to get my money back. And then they gave me a life, they also charged me a lifetime account. I don't know how that got charged. So I got charged $250 and I originally only wanted to spend 20 Thought, hey, 20 bucks, no big deal. If I, you know, works or not work. So after that fiasco, then I kind of was like uh, thinking, well, let's check out Photo P and Photoshop and, um, I ended up getting the Roberto Blake um, the starter kit. Really great guy on YouTube. And, you know, his stuff's good, but you got to use these Photoshop, Photo P, and the learning curve. I always say the learning curve is steep, and you wish the learning curve was steep. Because the learning curve was steep, it mean you'd quickly learn it, and then you wouldn't have to learn it anymore. The learning curve is really gradual, meaning you can just spend time and time and time. So I ended up staying up till about midnight last night, which you know is a little later than usual. Usually I try to go to bed 10, 11 o'clock, but I was up till midnight. Plus I was pissed off about them people trying to steal my money. Um, I talked to them today though, and it sounds like I got emails and they're going to give me back my money. So I got up this morning. It was a lot cooler because of all the smoke. Um, the air quality is pretty bad, so Blanca was having issues, but we went out and got the miles done. Got home, did a quick Pavel kettlebell, 100 swings with a pretty light weight. I only did like 15 pounds because I wanted to get out there and Grubhub DoorDash. Um, turned on the Grubhub like before 8 o'clock, and the first order, I get a decent order. Now, like with Grubhub and DoorDash, I don't take orders unless I'm making $8, $10 a delivery. I'm just not getting out of my car for anything less than that. And the first one was like $12, $13, so I was like, cool, take it. But then with Grubhub, you don't get to see exactly where you're going. I had to take it to Shafter. You know, I'm from California. Shafter's like 15, 20 miles away. Total BS. And then the problem is you're 10 miles out of the delivery zone, so you can't get other orders. So I was like so annoyed. So I got pissed off at Grubhub. You call Grubhub, of course. I never call Grubhub or Dash, DoorDash, driver assistance, whatever. So you're just talking to some call center. They don't really understand you. You don't understand them. They don't help. They just got 
a script they read off of, and so you just hang up on them. And I flipped over to DoorDash. DoorDash was, you know, decent enough. They did have a super cool um, five. If you did five breakfast deliveries before 11 o'clock, you got an extra 15 bucks. So I made my 60 bucks, got home, and then I've spent most of today just trying to figure out photo P, um, kind of using this SEO thing from Thumb Buddy, and just doing whatever I can to just try and, you know, make a better uh, presentation so that more of my more of this can get out into the world. And so with all that, I thought I'd now kind of go over some of my, and it sounds like I really shouldn't even be doing this. I've got, you know, I like doing this endurance noise daily, you know, endurance news around the world. But it seems like most stuff you need to be just really specific. Like I almost need to do like a, a one little thing on a particular race or one little thing on this instead of having this kind of hodgepodge kind of thing. So tell me if you like it, you know, like, click like it, you know, subscribe to the channel. I'd love to get subscriptions you know why give youtube all the money why give facebook all the money you know not that it's that big of a deal you can support the podcast through uh, patreon of course and you know the podcast i, I say podcast because i throw this up on the podcast which is my real first love because i'm not really a big fan that's how i got into podcasting was i didn't like to write and i was making videos for my athletes and whatnot but then i was like man i don't want to be on video because video is still a pain in the butt to handle i mean it's 2020 and it still takes forever to upload this stuff and edit it and just but it is what it is so anyways endurance noise this was kind of a couple days ago i've kind of been adding to this but uh the endurance noise first thing i thought i saw was training peaks uh had a great article find out what factors might affect the accuracy of your gps watch and it's basically hills turns tree cover may negatively impact your gps and cell phones of course are the worst and i have hiking people who swear by map my run and they use it on their phone i'm like it's a piece of crap i still remember you know doing like the grand canyon rim to rim to rim and just the gps going absolutely bonkers of course because you're down there in the canyon and all that kind of stuff and so yeah don't rely on them completely i always love when people get done with the race going my watch says it was this distance, and my watch says it's this distance. It doesn't matter. You know, when you're running a marathon, especially when you're slow like me and doing it in six hours, you got to go around all those people. You don't get to cut the tangents. And so usually when I do a marathon, it's 27-plus miles. In fact, I always say that 50Ks aren't really ultras. I mean, yeah, it's over a marathon. But if you run a big city marathon, you walk a mile or two to the start, you run the marathon, you don't get to run 26.2, and then you got to walk a mile or two back to your car. You get 30 plus miles in easy in a big city race. So uh, speaking of uh, racing and uh, other things that, you know, people yammer on about, oh, my GPS says this. It's also like cramps. And I'm like, oh, you need to take your salts and blah, blah, blah. It's like, And it says the problem with electrolytes theory is science keeps failing to back it up. People get cramps from all sorts of reasons, including underlying injury, disease, and medication side effects. Exercise associated cramps you get during running may be influenced by some secondary factors and some of it's your genes best predictor of cramp is whether you've cramped in the past and despite the potency of evidence it's entirely possible that in some people traditional risk factors like dehydration or electrolyte depletion may play a role so before i get too excited about the squats and a new miracle cure i like to see whether a few months of strength training actually reduces cramp risk in randomized trials it's basically saying and that's like i really believe i never get cramps and it's like you know because you train properly you know you don't train properly you're gonna have issues and all the you know magic cures and elixirs are just not gonna help you and it's you know it says it's tricky to get sorts of studies funded though there's no pharmaceutical money no sports drink money so for now if you're starting with recurring cramps you're left with trial and error it's worth giving strength training a shot and not just for its cramp benefits i'll be open to giving a hot shot a try too and hey whatever the evidence says i love bananas and um, yeah, it's just uh, you know, the, there's all these. I always tell people if all these pro sports products worked, the one they wouldn't have to advertise, and two, the people who invented would be billionaires, and we would all be fast, beautiful, blah blah blah. Um, saw this article outside magazine. They're talking about um, falling, and, and one of the reasons I do a lot of cross training, strength training, isn't necessarily to get improve my walking speed, or if I do run, it's more just when I fall, I don't fall like George Burns. And for you know, kids out there, George Burns was this old comedian. He was like 89. He used to do this really bad singing with a cigar. and you know. But I don't want to fall down and hurt myself. So I figure when I, when I fall, like I did when I fall on that grease, which that actually hurt myself. But I fall 
I don't fall properly and or when I do fall, I won't get so hurt. But uh, Max King has some uh, tricks to the trade about trail running, but it's pretty much anything. The best way to avoid falling is to study the trail for hazards well in advance or, you know, study the walk, the sidewalk, you know, be aware. Don't look at your feet. Scan the trail 10 meters ahead of you and you'll be able to react to objects in time. Shorten your stride, particularly running through technical rocky terrain will give you better control and quicken your reaction time. Yeah, don't do this big lumbering thing. But if you fall, you but if you run, you will fall. And that happens. My wife Blanca started walking with me almost every day back in 2017. And about a year ago, she tripped and fall. You know, we're out there in the dark. And, you know, she fell, but she handled it pretty good. And, in fact, she's been doing quite a bit of cross training, doing the kettlebell and, and the running drills. So it says, when you're going down, throw your hands out to protect your head and face, but don't stiffen your elbows. Think of your arms as shocks absorbing the impact. If you're moving at high speeds and falling head first, tuck your chin into your chest. Try to roll over your shoulder to ease the impact. King says, the more you practice, the better it will be go in the wild. Go back to what you do as a kid and work on your technique in a set environment like a grassy field or a padded gym floor. I kind of chalk up my ability to fall fairly well from skateboarding. I started skateboarding when I was 10 years old. And I skated all the way up into my 40s, pretty much until I started doing ultras about a decade ago or so. Kind of gave up the skateboard because I figured I'm doing all this training. The last thing I need to do is crash and get hurt. I mainly rode like ramps and pools. I wasn't doing any street skating because 250 pound guys can't ollie up on curbs and stuff. But I, it's funny, I actually have a little dent in my hand from all the falls. I, I rode standard foot, and so whenever I fall, this hand would reach out and hit the ground. And uh, the other one's not as bad, but definitely had my share of falling. Um, Jonathan Marcus tweeted out, If at first you don't succeed, try doing what your coach told you to do the first time. <laughs> oh, I could go on and on and about that. But, you know, people, it's interesting, like, people... When I started coaching uh, full time, 2009, you know, one of the first people I think doing online coaching and having a run camp, it was just uh, kind of unheard of 11 years ago. I, it was amazing how you know people would hire you and then not listen to you. So, yeah, um, bring back the mile. I was like their stuff. It says in case you missed it, time flies. 27 years ago, first man clocked a 345 uh, mile, and it was. Uh, Morse Lee, and uh, he runs with no fear. Runners in the Western world have a tendency to create psychological barriers for themselves. He runs at will. No inhibitions, Immune Coughlin said about Morse Lee and his running. And he was a phenomenal runner. Uh, I think it's probably easier to run the mile when you aren't from America because you're so used to the 1500. The mile doesn't have as much mystique as uh, the 1500 and stuff. Some more history, ultra running history says 100 mile history in the 50s. See, 100 milers didn't start with. Uh, Gordy in Western States it says Wally Hayward of South Africa broke the world record. Other stories: two twin brothers ran 100 miles to win the hand of a bride. <laughs> um, then we had some track action. There's another Diamond League meet. Um, Uganda has another up-and-coming star. This one's Jacob Kilmo, 19 years old, beat um, Salam Brag, who's 20 years old, in the 5K and 12:48. His personal best before that was 13:13. So he took off almost 30 seconds. Pretty awesome. It says. So after Ostrava, we're up to four sub-250 performances in the men's 5,000 in 2020. We only had, in 2012, we had six. And in 1997, we had five. And, of course, what did the Diamond League do this year to make it better for TV coverage? They got rid of the 5K. I'll tell you, though, one of the things you've seen why everybody's running so fast is because even from the pros on down, everyone's racing less and training more, and I think the focus is really helping. On um, the women's race in the uh, 1,500, Faith Kipnion won the uh, 1,500 meter in 3.59. Laura Whiteman and Gemma Riki go 2.3. British women have been running really well. They went 4.01.96 and 4.03.25. And then, of course, right off of her phenomenal world record in the hour race, which she beat the record by a lap, almost 413 meters, Safan Hassan won the 5K in 14.37 in a tactical race. Of course, only six other women in 2020 have run that fast. So she definitely had a... Uh, a good week. Um, Castro Semenya loses her appeal, which means we almost certainly will have a new Olympic champ at the 800. And, you know, it says after months of deliberation, the federal Supreme Court of Switzerland has refused to set aside a 2019 ruling against Olympic medal Sema, Se Castro Semenya, you know, and it's intersex athletes. And basically, like, it's really interesting. In the 800, pretty much intersex athletes pretty much have been winning and owning all the records. It's kind of that fine point. Once you get up to 1500, doesn't work as well and in the sprints 
it doesn't really happen so you know it's bad for her she said i am very disappointed by this ruling but refuse to let world athletic drug me drug me or stop me from being who i am excluding female athletes or in danger or endangering our health solely because of our natural abilities puts world athletics on the wrong side of history and you know that's kind of what you do with this whole thing it's kind of interesting it's kind of calmed down but you know you have um uh, trans uh, athletes running and men, you know, women's competition and, uh, you know, whole other ball of wax. Another good uh, race was uh, Jake Whiteman continued his performance. Great season. He ran 144 in an 800 that had 15 starters. You know, the world, you know, the world championships Olympics have eight, 15 guys. Pretty crazy. <laughs> but, and uh, let's see. One last thing I saw when I was supposed to be out in the High Sierra Trail this last weekend and or helping my friends. And one of the things you get out there in the mountains, thankfully in Bakersfield we don't get them, but you get mosquitoes. And man, mosquitoes love me and I can't stand them. But I saw this, somebody tweeted this, and I guess it's a thing called the bug bite thing is a suction solution. No creams, no chemicals, never expires. And this woman says that it basically started off on TikTok. It's a 0.3.2 ounce piece of plastic that functions like a syringe, but with a suction hole on one end. It supposedly pulls mosquito saliva out of bites to relieve the itching. Designed to work on bites and stings from bees, wasps, ants, and more. Thing was created by two entrepreneurs, Kelly Hegney and her mom, Ellen McAllister, who started selling the product out of their garage before appearing on the episode of Shark Tank in 2019. They succeeded. It's been a bestseller on uh, Amazon ever. I just sent that off to my group text of hiking ladies because, I don't know, if it works, it would be a pretty awesome. I think it's, I saw it was like maybe 20 bucks, so... Might be something that I might pick up or something you might give if you've got a friend who does a lot of hiking. Buy it for him for a gift. So, as always, stay healthy, be boring, not epic.